Hi, my name is Louisa Benson. Hi, my name is Eric Goldberg. Hi, I'm Mrs. Robledo Zad. My name's Allison Flitcher. Hello, this is Santiago Rubio. Hello, my name is Mr. Howard. I was not always interested in the subject matter I teach today. In fact, I dreaded reading and writing. When I was in school, I struggled with reading and writing. Now I love it. And math was always difficult for me. Whenever I would advocate for myself and go to study sessions and things like that with the teachers, it made things a lot easier. My worst subjects were probably the two subjects that you need the most for um, nursing, which was math and science. I've always been interested in social studies, learning about the world and history, making connections with like what goes on with our society and community has always been a deep passion of mine. Yeah, so when I began playing tuba and band during the seventh grade, that is when my love for music grew. And then when I was about a junior in high school is when I wanted to pursue music education. The most memorable teacher from my past is kind of a negative memory. It was when I went in because I didn't understand why my response was not considered a complete sentence. I heard her say under her breath, stupid blank, a derogatory term for an, uh, an immigrant child. I'll never forget hearing a teacher call me something like that. The teacher did not explain it to me in a way I understood. The teacher that I always remembered, my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Bright, not only did he teach classes, but he took a special interest in everybody. A teacher that I really admired was my sophomore year in high school. I had a teacher named Mr. Mix, who was an English teacher. He was the only teacher that could actually get me to read a book. He was a good dude. Teachers that were memorable. So my eighth grade math and writing teacher, Mr. Dilworth, shout out to Mr. Dilworth. He always like challenged me, and I think he always like made sure to like push me to my full potential. He did such a great job to make sure that I was always doing it and showing my best. The most embarrassing thing that happened to me when I was in school was when I was running out of the tennis courts and I went to push the metal door, which was stuck, so I ran right into it, smashed my nose, and blood came out like a faucet. I was covered in blood, everyone was looking at me and laughing, and it was awful. I played basketball in high school. Um, and I missed the buzzer beater. When I was in school, I had a very, very hard time with math. So the way that I overcame it was I tried to get extra help, but for some reason it just wasn't really clicking with me. The most embarrassing thing that happened to me in school. For junior year of high school, I, there was this girl that I had a very big crush on, and uh, it was PE class, and we were playing volleyball. I was goofing around with my buddies, and we were playing volleyball, and for some dumb reason I decided to, as the ball came down, instead of bumping it up like volleyball like you're supposed to. I kicked it and it went under the net and I ended up hitting the girl that I had a big crush on right in the stomach so hard that she fell over. <laughs> the most embarrassing thing that I did when I was in school, so I have an identical twin sister. I went to a Catholic school, so we had like uniform. We decided to switch classes because why not? and we got caught. So yeah, that was the most embarrassing thing because we got caught, but I don't recommend it. Don't do that if you're an identical twin. Stay the course, <laughs> follow the rules. I always love sports. I always love phys physical education. School for me was, was easy. Uh, I struggled in managing, had to work in my farm. I was playing soccer, competing at the national level. The teacher that inspired me to become a PE teacher was uh, one teacher whose name was Pedro. He was my physical education teacher.
it's very different um, now than it was before. Um, in the beginning of COVID, if I take us all the way back to um, January, February, and March of 2020, um, which is when we all started, the virus was much scarier than it is now. So we have adapted and learned from watching COVID that we know that it's not as scary as it was before. So we've adapted to that. We've changed. We're, we as healthcare nurses, doctors, and technicians, we were, we were frightened by, the, by COVID. And so we did many things that we had never done before um, in our career where we were very careful. We had to wear um, protective equipment that we had never worn before. Um, but as the virus progressed and changed, um, it became less scary. Well, that's that's kind of a tough one because we can only adjust to what we know. We went through lots of changes as the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, um, they were our main scientists that were helping us. We don't really do anything differently now with the information that we know that, that we did when COVID was really bad in the beginning. So what we do is we, we wait for the scientists at the CDC to tell us what level of precaution or care that we have to take to protect ourselves and to protect the patient. And we when we responded to what the CDC did then, that's the same thing we do now. So the, what I mean by that is, let's say there is a new virus that comes out next week. So next week some, out comes some new virus. We would do the same thing we did for COVID. We would wait for the CDC to give us instructions about what the scientists have tested or what they know about how to protect ourselves and how to protect the patient. And then we, we have protected ourselves against other things that have been threats. Now, most people never talk about AIDS anymore, but AIDS was just as scary as COVID to the healthcare nurses and doctors when it came out. And again, we listened to the CDC and the scientists and we followed how to protect the patient and how to protect ourselves. What we've taken away from this is that we have to really understand the science behind it. And then we have to learn how to adapt to it not being as scary and um, and then start to become feel like we're becoming normal again. Years ago, decades ago, I shall say, I was a very different person. I did change. I have changed. I was a lot angrier. I was a lot uh, more judgmental. I was a lot more unforgiving. I was a lot more aggressive. I had a lot more of an ego and a narcissistic edge of, you know, of what's in it for me, uh, you know, and, uh, and it was not satisfying. And it did not bring me joy, and it did not bring me a sustainable relationships, and it did not bring me inner peace. That's why I did my homework. I did the reading of, of the spiritual books, the metaphysical books, the religious books, the self-help books, uh, the, the positive psychology books. And I read as much as I can, and I learned these tools. Independent of becoming a doctor and a psychiatrist, it was long before all of that. I, I started to discover these tools of how to communicate more effectively, how to let go of anger, it's all can be done. Uh, easier said than done, sure, but it can be done. These tools that I share with you, they work if you work them. Uh, they've worked for me. I'm not perfect. I'm still working the tools. I'm still working the program, but I'm a lot happier. I'm a lot healthier. You know, uh, it's, it, so 
really don't look at me and see some guy who's just telling you stuff that he read in a book, you know, or that sounds good. Uh, no, this is practical information that I have uh, used on myself uh, and gotten positive results, and you can too. Anyone who has a growth mindset or a positive way of looking at change can definitely make it happen. A lot of people are afraid of change because they don't know what's going to happen in the future and what that could bring or what that would feel like. But if you sort of just accept that change is inevitable, it's the one constant we all have in our lives and just embrace it as if it's an adventure instead of something to be afraid of, you can really have a positive mindset and actually have amazing experiences because you're open to it and you're not trying to run away from it. How do people change their life? I think if you want to change your life, you start by making small changes each day. It's not a huge overhaul that you do all at once. You start with small habits that you think you can stick to and then build on those habits over time. Hi, I'm Bob. And I'm Todd. And today we're going to go on a vacation. But there's one problem. We don't have the money and we don't have access to our passports. But we're prepared. First, boys, it's time for school. I'm fine. First look, a taxi. Yeah, this is our chance. Ready? This is an airport taxi. Yeah. How do you know? I do. It says airport taxi. What kind oh, of my car bad. do you have? Hey, like, they I have an have iPad. That's is cool. It Let's new? do it. Warning. The following sequence is a roughly 15 second montage of Bob and Todd running through the airport to get onto the airplane without having to pay. If you do not like or get uncomfortable around any of these things, then close your eyes and cover your ears until you hear the ching sound. Thanks, you. Jump off here. Three, okay. two, one. Oh. Oh. 
Children? No, I haven't. Wait, Mom, why are you here? Well, we were going to go to Disneyland. Anyway, the real question is, why are you here? Uh. <clears throat> When I ate the cookie, that is when my life really changed. He was fine at the party. But then on Valentine's Day... I felt guilty the whole year knowing that this was his first panic attack. Hi, I'm Mason Cipher and I have won the fight of my life. I picked him up from his friend Chase's house where he had just eaten a peanut butter cookie. Before I ate the cookie, Chase's mom, Julie, asked me, Do you have a peanut allergy? I went to check on Mason, and as soon as he told me that his throat was scratchy, I wondered if he was having an allergic reaction. Turns out it was, and by the end of the night, I was covered in hives, so we used the EpiPen. 30 minutes later, his symptoms had improved, and off the bed he went. So we took him to an allergist, and he tested positive for a peanut allergy. We talked to her to see how I would handle food now that I have a peanut allergy. It seemed easy. If he had had a sesame allergy his whole life, this should be easy. I was fine at the Super Bowl party I hosted. But then on Valentine's Day, he had his first panic attack. I ate the gummy hearts that my mom had bought me thinking they were fine until I checked the package after swallowing the candy. And sure enough, it was made of shared equipment with peanuts. I started freaking out thinking this was an allergic reaction. But it wasn't. It was his first panic attack. I felt guilty that entire year thinking it was all my fault. I got through that panic attack thinking this was it, but little did I know, school would be much, much worse. Now the week of Valentine's Day was tough, but I got a therapist on short notice who taught me strategies to help fight my anxiety. Luckily, I also had amazing teachers and administrators to help me at school. I felt sympathy towards you, it made me feel sad, I didn't like to see you so upset, but it also, it made me feel closer to you as a student. Later, my first therapist was no longer able to fit me in for therapy, and so we found another incredible therapist named Mona. We were able to do Zoom meetings with her, where she was able to teach me new strategies to deal with my anxiety, or she called it, bully in my head. She even had a really cute dog named Honey. Yes, it's common for people to have anxiety about allergies. So sometimes it can get, you know, out of hand and they need to come see me. At first, the Zoom meetings were helpful, but once I was on medication for my anxiety, the meetings weren't as helpful. So we decided to start meeting in person where we began exposure therapy. started exposure therapy, I knew that you were scared, but I also thought that you were ready. We were a few months away from camp, so we decided to start focusing on getting ready for camp and anything I might encounter. I helped prepare you for camp by going over all the things that I thought could possibly come up for you at camp. The 
book I got was a therapy book. In the book, I learned something that I use to this day. The acronym for fear is false evidence appearing real. This is very helpful because the bully in my head is not gone, but he is just weaker. <laughs> yes. What is your favorite part of, of your job? Favorite part of my job, besides meeting with you right now, would be coming into the cafeteria during lunchtime and seeing everyone and just sitting down and hanging out. Favorite all time. <laughs> what is something you would change? About Northwood? Yeah. Hmm. I would change our start time to later so we all can sleep in. I would probably change our schedule. I don't love our schedule. The block schedule gets me confused in the A days, and I would love to see more minutes of math. Yes, fantastic. Uh, I'd probably like to integrate a couple more fun student-friendly activities during the school year. We have a lot of fun ones, but definitely not enough to keep us excited all the time. What is your least favorite? Oh, well, that would probably be paperwork in the evenings and answering a lot of emails and I would have to say every administrator would say their least favorite part of the job is dealing with discipline. Hi everyone, we're just going to walk in and say hello to the world's best nurse. Hey! Hi. <laughs> hello, well hello. Come on, we're taking a walk around this lovely building. Out into the lovely hallway we should answer that of the most right beautiful there. building in the state of Illinois. There's a nice classroom and we have our fancy bathrooms with this beautiful colored bathroom. Come on and see what's happening down here. I think we have a lot of sixth graders. They're learning math in there. Hi teachers. ELA over here. Hi students. <laughs> Grade ELA, remember when you were sixth graders? No. Thank you for walking down the hall with Miss Rach. This is where all the magic happens. Without our main office, nothing would be organized in this school. And one of our main helpers is this lovely lady right here. Miss <laughs> Benson, what is your first impression, or what was your first impression of Ms. Rach? My very first impression of Mrs. Rach was that she was very professional, yet personable. In other words, she does want to get the job done, take care of students in a mature and professional way, but she understands us as people, too. So if I had to describe Ms. Rach in a few words, I would say that she is extremely professional in the six years that I've known her. Um, I think through her work she shows that she puts students first all the time and also she has this very unique energy and enthusiasm about her role here in Northwood that it's really refreshing. What piece of advice Ms. Rach has given you? So over the years um, in working with Ms. Rach, um, there hasn't been necessarily an opportunity where she's told me this but from watching her work I have learned that um, it's really okay if you don't know something or you don't know how to help someone uh, to take pause and learn together and figure it out together. I think that's the most valuable thing that I've learned from this range.
How long have you been playing lacrosse for? Three and a half years. Are you having fun playing lacrosse? I am. I've been playing it for a very long time, so yes, I am. Well, how much have you seen lacrosse grow in the past three and a half years of your playing time? I've seen it grow a lot. A lot more people have come and played the sport. Like, people that are just your friends, you come tell them about it, and then they come play and come and turn into really good athletes and really good lacrosse players. How long have you been playing lacrosse for? I just started. This is my first year. It's been a great time so far, though. Uh, and how much have you seen it grow since you started? I've seen a lot of people join the league. It's fun, and I've been also liking it. Zipping through the forest with my curtain leaves To go with the spindles for the mutant I seize I capture the dread beast who falls to his knees And cries to a forest asleep in the trees
gun in front of you. Apple toast bed heated for a blink of rat. Laugh with the sheep, say, please don't do that. Control for the smile, this can't be bought. So the girl starts to cry. Was this for this my life I sought? Maybe so, maybe so. The lack of social interaction made me really lazy, and I stopped like getting up every morning to go right on my schoolwork. I just stopped paying attention. According to nces.ed.gov, about 10% of adults with children in school reported that in September 2021 that their children had attended a summer school program to catch up with lost learning time during the pandemic. Well, um, online learning and COVID really affected my um, map test wrote then um, after COVID happened and we um, had to do online learning, my grades really, really went down. It was, it was not the best experience ever. With the effects of COVID-19, according to edweek.org, teachers who were teaching remotely were 60% more likely to feel socially isolated. How hard was it to adapt to teaching music virtually? It was really hard <laughs> because technology doesn't exist for us to all play together in a situation and kind of the whole point of what we're doing is it's a community activity, you know, so it, it was hard to figure out how to get everybody together. What were some major challenges you faced while being a principal during a lockdown? I think one of the major challenges was just how to retain culture and the fun and excitement of a school environment while being in a lockdown setting. You know, if everybody who was learning at home, we couldn't do things like have admin webinars or see each other at lunch recess or during PE where we're running around those like group 
areas or even in the hallways in the passing periods where we just get to say hi to each other um, and in the mornings where we congregate like all of that was stripped away and so I think the biggest challenge was finding ways to um, to figure out how to get our student body a little bit more connected during that time where we were so isolated. You've been brought here for one reason, to steal us some ice cream. This won't be easy, but you'll be rewarded handsomely. How much is the pay? A quarter of the money. We're in. So what's the plan? Alright, here we go. Our score is at Nexus Industries. First, I was going to fly Then Teddy gets us through the vents and mounts a charge at the doors. Then, with Ben's hacking help, Snow will get into storage with some acrobatics. Snow's been our inside girl for a couple of months now. I'm the inside girl. Now, Teddy's charge will explode. All of us will get in, and Allie will take out the final guard. Finally, we all converge in storage. Grab the ice cream and run. We get our share. Everyone lives happily ever after. Seems easy enough. Ready for the extraction, Teddy? 10-4, good buddy. Let's go. Our share awaits us. Ah! Whoa, what happened? A double cross. You might not know this, but Tarallos are evil. I want the ice cream for myself. <laughs> Get the other charge, Teddy. What? I have a feeling somebody here isn't with us. Here's the second charge, just in case. Okay. Allie, grab the ice cream. The rest of you, get out with me. No! How Test Stress Affects Students by Rad Studios. How does testing create a change of stress in students and their well being? Testing, a basic part of school's foundation. But what we are wondering is what its effects are for students' stress levels. This brings us to our main question How do tests affect the stress levels of students? How does testing create a change of stress in students and their well-being? Now, taking tests can be stressful for many people. Even if you say this doesn't count for your grade, I think still kids and adults when they take it still can be a little nerve-wracking. Certainly, I see a lot of stress when it comes to assessments at Edgewood. Um, I see students you know, get anxious about taking tests and wanting to do well. So I do see that stress as well, especially when testing IR as well. 
Some students, um, if it's time, that can stress people out, right? So you can't go back and check, yes. Uh, because I'm a person that I like to go to the ones that I know the, the best and then go back and, and go to the ones I don't know as much, right? So if there's no back button, that can be stressful for people, right? If there's a larger packet, let's say it's a test or quiz in the school setting, not like maps or state or district, um, but more like a classroom one, if it's a packet and it looks overwhelming just by seeing it, that can get stress instead of taking a moment to look at it first before getting stressed out, right? In fact, studies have improved that students' stress levels increase when put to the challenge of testing. Studies show that 32.5% of students struggle with test anxiety. Studies show that testing can lower self-confidence as well as causing major stress before, during, and after a test. How does testing affect the atmosphere of a room? Yeah, I, I, when I walk into classrooms where it's just regular class going on, I always don't want to walk into a classroom where there's a test taking place because it's just, you know, silent and it's more intense. Um, so the atmosphere has definitely changed. I, I think it's, it's, and it's normal because you are trying to focus on exactly what you're trying to focus on to show your mastery or take the test. And I see any teach to each student, so it does change the dynamic of the classroom. Stress can affect students' scores, making it even harder for stress-prone students to get high scores. This can affect their self-confidence, worsening stress. <laughs> students judge themselves more than you think for your average assignments. Does getting a higher score affect your self-confidence? 100%, but again, let's say, realize that they got different questions, okay? Number two, um, let's say you got different t teachers, right? For for let's say let's say it's science time, so you got different teachers, so you might do differently that way. Or sometimes we're just better at some subjects than others, and that's okay. Or like maybe that unit is really hard, but the next unit. Like, so I try to ha encourage students to look at the big picture as well as parents and guardians. Look at the big picture instead of just the specific. I think people generally want to do well. So I think that's because they want to do well. And I do think a lot of people compare themselves to other people, um, especially with like map testing when students are getting different questions. I really encourage them, don't compare yourself to yourself. Like, let's see, did you go up that what you did last? If you too are getting stressed during tests, here are some ways that you can stress less. How can you stress less during tests? To, to study, right? I encourage they need help and don't understand certain concepts. And also we talked about that self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, if you go in to the test going, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. Even if you study, you might not do as well. attitude along with studying, you might do better. So you got to go in with that positive attitude as well. I think preparation is key. So as soon as when a teacher tests and it's going to be on Wednesday, I find that it's best to start preparing like that day. And just little by little, doing a little bit each night helps me to be less stressed when in preparation for an assessment than like putting it off and, you know, waiting till the night before a test to really kind of like wrap my mind. You just want to make sure that you're planning accordingly so you just don't rush and put whatever down the last time.
Because we were trying to catch her for a whole week. You're a big help, Green Ninja. You're welcome. Anytime, cop. Just call me. Ah, what a nice day. Wait a second. Wait, what? Where's my motorcycle? Oh, no. Oh, I know. I'll go look for it myself. But that's going to be a tough journey. What a day. Ah, what a nice night. That was a good night's sleep. Ha ha ha. Only the legendary Golden Ninja has a chance of defeating me. Ha ha ha! I give up. Here's your motorcycle for you. Bye. And that's how I defeated the Overlord. When I grow up, I want to be a ninja, just like you. Oh, come on. Oh, please. Oh, please. This is so ridiculous. I mean, we had to work out some custody. Clarissa right? knows exactly what she is doing, all right? She uses John and she puts him in the middle between you and she just yeah. runs you oh, in. Oh, please. Like, we have a kid together. We, I do have responsibility. Now the father.
Hey, Anna. Hey guys. Have you heard about that girl? She's like struggling from depression or something. Yeah, I've heard she's like been in the hospital for a month. Yeah, that's really weird. You know, the only thing that I even liked about her was her necklace. Um, I'm gonna be late. I'll talk to you guys later. <sighs> What's up with her? Who knows? She's probably depressed like that other girl. Ew. It's okay. I did worse than you. I'm Meredith. What's your name? I'm Anna. I've seen you before. Did you just move here? No, I was in a mental health clinic for like that girl. Months, and I She's like that struggling out. from depression or something. You know, the only thing that I even liked about her was her necklace. You know, you okay? Oh, sorry. I just zoned out a bit. It's okay. I was just saying how I was struggling for a while and how I'm better now. And what helped you get better? 
Well, I like to journal. I journal a lot. Talk about my day, what bothered me, what I enjoyed, and everything in between. It really helped me overcome my depression and uplift my spirits. Do you get what I mean? Actually, I do. I never really talk about my mental health with people because of, you know, the... The stigma? Exactly. <laughs> just a really nice uh, thing to get you centered and um, calm again and ready for the next thing. I like yoga because it helps me bring peace and regenerate me from lunch and it helps me just calm down. Edward Yoga Club wrote Rangas about their experiences with practicing yoga. I'm a little stressed. Energy level is high. But now I feel good. It is not about the pose. It is about the pause. I feel quite relaxed. I notice that I am calm. I feel so peaceful. Lunchtime yoga helps so much. Finding stillness is calming. I breathe and relax. I feel much better. I'm still tired, but this helps a lot. I feel centered and grounded. The afternoon will be nice. Yoga is calming. It is very relaxing. Namaste, peace, calm. I feel very excited. Now I feel so very calm. Rebounding is ridiculously simple, but it can also be fun. 
It has an added benefit of helping to bring better balance to your nervous system, particularly if you're prone to anxiety. Uh, rebounding really helps. Uh, for example, I'm an actress, and whenever I'm about to go on stage, I get stressed sometimes, so uh, it's always really nice uh, knowing that you can rebound. Sometimes I'm silly, and I'm not so serious. Yoga can be fun. I feel very excited and ready for more yoga. Connections are made through yoga poses with friends, fun, smiles, laughter, joy, fun. I am calm but still awake. I can better deal with stress. I'm a warrior. I am strong, proud, resilient. Balanced and focused. I'm having a great time. I cannot wait for next week. Horses go clunk clunk, balloons go drop drop, popcorn goes pop pop, and my friend goes chomp chomp.
Tommy. These are my dogs, Super and Hero. What lessons have you learned from taking care of your dogs? I've learned a lot. I mean, it's a lot of care because they're, I mean, they're living animals. You have to take them on walks, you have to exercise, you have to a ball for them. And I've learned from that to even take care of myself and other people. So, have your dogs like ever helped you through any tough times in your life? Yeah, they have. I remember in fourth grade, I broke my elbow very badly, and no one was home at the house because my parents had to work, and my sister was at school. And so a couple days, I mean, my mom would be home, but my dogs are there, and it's, it's comforting. How does having a dog affect positively or negatively on your everyday life? Well, positively, they run around, they're cute. People like to see them all the time. Um, negatively, they like to eat a lot of things and are very food motivated. Do you think that your dogs have changed your life? Yes. I mean, like, they've been there for me. They've, it's so, like, I, I love them. I don't think there's words to describe that. So what specifically do you train dogs for? For families, so that they can have a good family dog. So do you train your dogs? Like what methods do you use? We use Lima, which is least invasive, minimally aversive. Um, and with that, that means that we do our best to give the dogs um, an opportunity to, to learn before we start to tell them that they're doing something wrong. Do these dogs affect you in your everyday life? Yes unconditional love and joy um i can't imagine living without a dog uh yeah and then when it comes to our client dogs um it's really rewarding to see when someone takes what you've been teaching their dog and they continue with it and they see improvements and start to have a better relationship with their dog which in turn makes us feel good because that's what we're trying to accomplish. What lessons have you learned from training um, dogs? Patience. Patience. Patience is probably the biggest one. Being, being calm, <laughs> being positive, um, being a good leader. So how do these dogs help people? Um, makes them happy, brings them joy, um, brings them <laughs> comfort. You know, we, there are dogs that are emotional support dogs. There are dogs that um, are service dogs that actually help people with some sort of physical or mental impairment that they have. And that dog can help that person live a better, more independent life.
I think PE is the most beneficial because it's a good way to get some nice exercise and interact and bond with your friends. The activity that intrigues me the most is probably flag football because it's very fun and I enjoy playing it with my friends. I think others will choose the same thing because I, I think that other students uh, at Northwood will also enjoy PE. Um, ELA because it helps you with your writing and grammar skills and math like doesn't really help you with anything farther in life because it's like a bunch of numbers. Um, I think others would agree because reading is important and it can help you find a lot of jobs. That is most intriguing to me is when we read and write because it helps you be smart. I think the most beneficial class of all Northwood Junior High or Northwood Middle School, however you say, you know, is maybe ELA. Um, yeah, ELA. I think um, most intriguing about ELA class is maybe teachers. Um, the lessons in ELA are really fun. So you get to collaborate with your peers. And yeah, I don't think others will choose the same thing. Maybe they might because the teacher is really nice. Ms. Benson is really nice. Math. Because of the proficient activity and sufficient resources between the supplementary angles and the Pythagorean theorem really helps my brain uh, mentally and both physically between the psychology and the economics between the resources of the math. I don't think other people would choose math because it's not the most like entertaining subject. Um, also, when there's other subjects like PE, people can really inspire to be others. The thing that in, in class that intrigues me the most is, is definitely the intuitive and intriguing mindset that we have to do to be logical and um, entrepreneurative. That's the most beneficial to me is PE because that's where you get to exercise. I think some others might choose this class as the most beneficial because other people might agree with my opinion about how PE could help like you physically and you like mentally. My fellow Huskies, the most beneficial class at Northwood Middle School is PE because you get to run around and let out your silly mongoose. I believe other students will also choose PE because they will let out their energy and play sports they love. Favorite thing to partake in PE is playing basketball and shooting some hoops. Sometimes you do. Yeah, just patience some time. The words begin to hear.
it's on the court that I find myself. You might be wondering who I am, so let me introduce myself. Hi, I'm Ethan Keith Mom, and I like the ball. Witness the power of this. I'm about to win it again. I let the energy in. Then I can maneuver. I lost the phone. Why am I even doing this? I spent so much time and effort training. Do you think it'll ever show? I guess you'll just have to find out. You should be missing this. I gotta win it again. I'm on an energy kick. Mission to turn it up, sharpen the blade, I get it done. Don't get the energy crossed up. Hate on the vision, they lost us. Wanted the best and they called one. I am really feeling awesome. Are you ready? Wanted the pressure, I never complain. Shake it off, figure it back in the game. And we lost it all today Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same If I showed you my flaws If I couldn't be strong Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same Right about now If I judge for life, man Would you stay by my side Or is you gonna say goodbye Can you tell me right now See things in life Shawty, would it be alright? Come and show me that you do Now tell me, would you really ride for me? Really ride Baby, me? tell me, would you die for me? me would you, you spend your whole life with me? Would you be there to always hold me down? Uh-huh. Tell me, would you really cry for me? Really cry for me? Baby, don't lie to me, Baby, lie to me. If I didn't have anything I wanna know, would you stick around? If I got locked away And we lost it all today Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same? If I showed you my flaws If I couldn't be strong Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same? Skiddly down, 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 down All I want is somebody real who don't need much I got I know that I can trust to be here when money low If I did not have nothing else to give but love Would that even be enough? Y'all me need for no Now tell me, would you really ride for me? Baby, tell me, would you die for me? Would you spend your whole life with me? Would you be there to always hold me down? Tell me, would you really cry for me? Baby, don't lie to me If I didn't have anything I want to know, would you stick around? If I got locked away And we lost it all today Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same? If I showed you my flaws If I couldn't be strong Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same? Tell me, tell me, would you want me? Tell me, tell me, would you call me? If you knew I wasn't ballin' Cause I need a girl who's always by my side Tell me, tell me, do you need me? Tell me, tell me, do you love me? Or is you just tryna play me? Cause I need a girl to hold me down for life If I got locked away And we lost it all today Tell me honestly Would you still love me? If I showed you my flaws If I couldn't be strong Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same? If I got locked away And we lost it all today Tell me honestly Would you still love me the same? If I showed you my flaws And if I couldn't be strong Tell me honestly Would you still love me
first question is, what's the medical like thing for Ari's heart? Like, sure. So, do you remember what it's called? SVT. So Ari has something called SVT, which stands for supraventricular tachycardia. And what that means is that the heart beats too fast. There was a lot of really hard things when Ari was in the hospital. So most of the times when Ari had to go to the hospital, it wasn't planned and it was an emergency. Okay. So, Art, so Ari had to wear um, monitors, heart monitors, that were live monitored um, by a company in New Jersey, actually. And so they would see when his heart wasn't behaving. And so we would get phone calls and they would say, you have to take him to the emergency room. physical illness, huh? Well, um, there's actually a few, um, but I have to say, um, unfortunately, I have seen um, and I'm aware of cancer affecting a lot of students, either them personally or someone in their lives. So my specialty is, it's called pediatric critical care medicine. What that means is I only take care of patients in the pediatric intensive care unit. So the very, very sick children. This is, yes. So the, which is really sad. The, this, this has been studied. There's like papers about this. The rate of divorce in families of children with chronic illness is higher than the general population. But cancer, usually it's not, cancer, like patients who have cancer and they go through their treatment, those families are usually pretty, I mean, there are some that have divorce, of course. I'm talking about the long-term kids who are, so for instance, and it's a lot of them are patients that were born prematurely, are in the NICU for like six, eight months for the first, you know, they don't go home until they're like eight or nine months old. They end, and even those babies, those are fine, but I'm talking about the ones that aren't fine. They end up with a tracheostomy, which do you know what that is? It's an artificial airway. So, so babies who can't get off the ventilator, they have a breathing tube for a really long time and we try to take it out. They don't breathe, we have to put it back in. At a 4th of July barbecue, so I wasn't watching the news, and then my sister, who lives in St. Louis, texted me and said, I can't believe what's going on in Highland Park, and I had no idea. It was one of the most difficult days of my life, you know. Probably the most challenging day of my career. Some of the folks waiting on the street told us, you know, it sounds like gunshots. Initially, it was just kind of shock, and then the next thing that popped in my head was we've got to get these people off the street. I really felt scared at the school after what happened over the 4th, but you know, I recognized that there would be many feelings, many emotions, and a lot of people had more of a direct connection to what happened over the 4th than others. And I am confident that school is a safe place for us. And everyone kept talking about it, but they didn't have the same connection to it. We wanted, most of all, to make sure that the entire community at camp felt safe. You start 
questioning, is anything safe anymore? And then you realize, yes, it is. And we keep trying to improve on that. Initially, I thought there were fireworks and then quickly realized it's not fireworks. Fortunately, had other people too that were able to kind of inform the situation and let us know what it really was. Part of, you know, the initial challenge was figuring out how do we communicate something this tragic with a camp community and make sure that information is being shared in an appropriate way, in an organized way. And how to tailor that for different ages. I started off as a normal day, um, kind of uh, filled with excitement, thinking it was going to be a, a nice opportunity to meet a bunch of new people, um, and then quickly turned. Um, still ended up making a lot of new friends um, through the course of the day, but just not as I would have wanted to. So almost immediately after um, the, the shooting, um, so the moment we started hearing gunshots, that's when people started coming in. And then um, we had the last few people leave um, about four and a half hours later. We were just standing there enjoying the parade. It's kind of like we didn't really realize what was happening until it, everybody was running toward us. It's about coming back for you. So um, we were at Central and St. John's. We, my family ran down Central and turned left toward Norton's. And right at the corner, Jeff and I immediately said we need to find Elsie to each other. And a lot of people won't turn around and go back, but we both immediately felt like we had to go back. I'm just really proud of, of people like the students in our building who are really you know, taking time to process this in their own way and to process what happened in their own way and to share messages. We all just want to do better and, and just, you know, support one another. And so I think that's, I think that's what makes me happy. Yeah, we were able to welcome folks in, um, those that were comfortable coming back. Um, and uh, it was a nice opportunity to see people in happier circumstances. Um, that day was so charged that having people back in here enjoying themselves um, really kind of healed uh, me at least um, feeling like we could we could move forward. I don't really like being in big huge situations like that anymore I felt weird. I didn't feel trapped in that situation but I certainly don't want to feel trapped in a situation like that. It definitely uh, impacted my comfort level in most public places. It took some, some time, some therapy, and a lot of talking and crying. <laughs>